The following is a class on the Mumbai Mirror by His Loneliness Bhakti Vikas Swami, recorded on Monday, October the 20th, 2008, in Chopati. Mumbai, India. And on the front page of this Kali Yuga Purana is the headline Sewage Water Clean Enough to Drink. <laughs> and there's a photo of a student smelling a urinal. <laughs> All right, so let's get the, the purple to the sh Today's shlok, today's joke, but it's not a joke. That's what's more crazy about it. If it was a joke, it would just be a joke, but this is the headline. So, all right, let's speak about this. We're supposed to speak from Shastra, but as I said, this is the, this is the upper Shastra. The opposite of Shastra. Om Jnana Timiram Dhasya Jnanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshura Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Lema Tande Ham Shri Guru Shri Atav Padatamalam Shri Guru Navaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sagranarakhanatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parajana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Sri Radha Krishna Padan, Sahagana Lalita, Sri Vishatam, Vita Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So as you've all dedicated your lives in Srila Prabhupada's mission, you should know that Srila Prabhupada's mission was to expose the nonsense of modern so-called civilization. That was one of the uh, principal points of Srila Prabhupada's ministration. Srila Prabhupada was not a pie-in-the-sky spiritualist. You know what pie-in-the-sky, head-in-the-clouds. Srila Prabhupada was very much down to earth, not this far down, means he came to our platform to pull us up. He didn't come down to our platform, but he spoke to us on a level we could understand. And he pointed out his modern civilization is insane. And Srila Prabhupada was very aggressive in attacking all the nonsense of modern civilization. I was just listening to a lecture by Sada Puta Prabhu, who maybe you know passed away just about two weeks ago, suddenly. So Sada Puta Prabhu was analyzing this, how Srila Prabhupada was, he wasn't the archetypal or stereotypical kind of sadhu just holding a flower and smiling. But Srila Prabhupada was very aggressive. He said, you should expose these rascals who are misleading civilization. He used words like this, attack, attack them. Expose these rascals. This is, this is the language Prabhupada would use. So there's no doubt that Srila Prabhupada was very aggressive. Now when we think about sadhus, we don't think about aggressive. We had one joke, that's the front page of the newspaper, I'll get back to that later. It would be a joke if it wasn't actually the front page of the newspaper. But uh, there's one thing which I saw on TV years ago. Here we are going into the realm of Maya again. Ah, we're not speaking on Bhagavad Gita. 
But I remember seeing this on TV years ago, and I was, even now it was in a comedy program, and even now when I think of it, I laugh because it's so funny. And they had a, it was a, a skit of the bishop walking down the street. Now the bishop, you know, you think, of course in, in India you have sadhus more, but in the Western world there's Christianity, so the bishop is considered to be very, you know, very kind and very nice, isn't it? You've heard of bishops? They have, it's not an, it's not a, an extinct word in the English language yet. <laughs> so, this bishop was walking down the road like this, with two men at his side, with black, like mafia men at his side. And they're walking down the road like this. And then they burst into someone's office, open the door, and the guy sitting there on his desk says, ah, ah, the bishop, like he's so afraid of him. So it's just the opposite, it's absurd. The comedy of the absurd, because you expect a sadhu, and then the, the, this, this, the bishop has this kind of stick, it's called a mitre, a mitre, something like this. So he pulls out his cigar, and just like the tree down, he pulls down the top, and it's like a big cigarette lighter, and he lights his cigar with it. <laughs> it's absurd, but it's so funny. <laughs> Because you expect a sadhu to be very peaceful and gentle, isn't it? But this was a sadhu, but he was dressed like a sadhu, but the profile was more like a mafia man. Like very aggressive, and someone, if you see, you're very afraid. So that's how comedy works. You put two things together which don't fit, and it becomes funny. So like that, Prabhupada was a sadhu, right? Srila Prabhupada is a sadhu. And he was very aggressive. And those two things, we don't think they should go together. Titikshava karunika suhridam sarvadehina ajata shatrava shanta. What's the last line? Sadhavo sadhu, sadhu bhushana. So a, a sadhu is tolerant, merciful, friend to everyone. His enemy is never born, the, and these are the characteristics of a sadhu. But Srila Prabhupada was unabashedly aggressive. In other words, he, he, do you know what unabashedly means? It means he wasn't trying to cover it up, he wasn't, he was very open about it. He, he wasn't uh, outwardly just smiling and inwardly uh, making some plans. Sometimes there are sadhus in India, so-called sadhus, who do that. They look very peaceful up front, but behind the scenes they're plotting to have their enemies murdered. They may not do it themselves, but they do it. It happens. When Srila Prabhupada was preaching, there, there were two... Indian sadhus who were very prominent in America at that time. Means not sadhus, but bogus completely. So one of them was famous for he had long hair, that's the first qualification of sadhu, and long beard, and that's the main qualification of the sadhu. <laughs> and he was always smiling. But Srila Prabhupada was often very aggressive, and like I say, unabashedly. When uh, in Amsterdam, Srila Prabhupada performed a deity installation, it, there, there was live TV coverage all over Holland, which isn't a very big country, but anyway, it's about the same population, I guess, as Greater Mumbai today. So it was live coverage, and Prabhupada's disciples there, they'd, they'd goofed up pretty much everything. It was just a complete, complete chaos. They didn't, everything they would, they had organized wrongly, and everything was wrong, and then Prabhupada was just right there on live on TV, chastising them, getting angry at them, shouting at them. Prabhupada didn't mind that people went, oh, oh, oh. 
holy man getting angry. He didn't mind. So, aggressive. Prabhupada was aggressive. Now, aggressive, when we think of aggressive, what do we think of? We think of... Aggressive means nasty, doesn't it? Aggressive means performing activities meant to harm us. We, we think of physical violence, or at least uh, implied or threatened violence. Aggressive means, and often aggressive means like without any real reason, just, just to be nasty. Again, going back to my generation, the word aggressive in Britain, which was where this particular bag of bones that I'm inhabiting at the present time was born, that, uh, that word was there, agro, that was used for gangs who used to go around and fight with each other. Why? No real reason, just because they're nasty, that's all. They, well, sometimes they have a football team as a reason to be nasty, supporters of different football teams, but just aggressive, just nasty. They, they like, they think that it's very good to be aggressive. And Srila Prabhupada himself was aggressive and he told his disciples, be aggressive for Krishna. He was told. Some of his lady disciples who were distributing Srila Prabhupada's books, they asked him that, well, we're supposed to be humble, but when we're distributing books, we can't be very humble because in America in those days to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books, meant, uh, at least the devotees hadn't worked out any other way to do it, but they were <coughs> quite aggressive in their techniques, because basically people didn't want the books. And devotees practically had to mentally overpower them to get them to take it, to buy a book which they didn't want. So they asked Srila Prabhupada about this, and Prabhupada they were saying, well, how can we be humble? Prabhupada said, be aggressive for Krishna. Arjuna was aggressive for Krishna. Hanuman was aggressive for Rama. Why do we worship Hanuman as a great devotee? Well, he's always chanting Rama, 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 Rama. But that's not the reason. There are so many people who chant Rama, 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 Rama. But Hanuman, because he was aggressive for Lord Rama. We glorify him for burning down Lanka. That's not a very nice thing to do, is it? If someone came and set half of Bombay on fire, well, that's what the modern uh, jihad, that's the idea, right? Killing people in the name of Allah because they're sinful. In, For instance, in Bali some years ago, the bombs went off and now the per, the persons who did that they're about to be executed and they're not remorseful they say yes the people who got killed by us they deserved it because they're sinful so of course we're not suggesting that we do that and even Srila Prabhupada he didn't condone it when some people who were not exactly his disciples but uh they considered themselves his disciples. I don't think they were initiated. But they got, they were in New Zealand, they got killed when their bombs went off. They were going to blow up a slaughterhouse. They, they were planning to blow up a slaughterhouse and they got killed themselves. But Prabhupada, he didn't approve of bombing. When he was told about this, he didn't approve of that. So it's, not, it's, not a, it's not going to stop animal slaughter. I mean, it might temporarily stop some animal slaughter, but the, the, the principle it is Srila Prabhupada was philosophically aggressive. Now, he didn't recommend going around and having physical violence, although 
he did suggest that that might be necessary for devotees at some point in time, in some circumstances. But he was philosophically very aggressive. He wanted to expose the demoniac civilization. And in personal dealings, sometimes also he was very aggressive. Not all the time, but many times. One time in Philadelphia, in USA, one professor was introduced to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada asked him, what do you teach? The professor said, Hinduism. Prabhupada said, what do you mean by Hinduism? And the professor thought he would give a very clever reply. His, his clever reply was, I don't know. So Srila Prabhupada turned to Srup Damada Brahmachari, who later became Bhakti Srup Damada, and said to him, well, what do you call a person who doesn't know what he purports to teach? And Srup Damada said, a cheetah, Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada turned to this man and said, you see, he's also a PhD. He has given the verdict, you are a cheetah. That was the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it went downhill from there. And eventually the man became so offensive to Prabhupada. Prabhupada was shouting at him and he was shouting back. And big Brahmananda had to tell the man, you better, you better leave now before you get too offensive. Another time in America, there's a professor was introduced to Prabhupada and I, he asked, Prabhupada asked him, what are you teaching? He said, biology. <coughs> Prabhupada said, poor frogs. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? He said, you cut up frogs. So he said, well, that's for the advancement of science. Prabhupada didn't accept. That's, uh, that's sinful. The frog has to suffer. So, anyway, Srila Prabhupada was aggressive, there's no doubt. And sometimes people question that. I mean, I often had the experience, somehow or other, especially in Malaysia, which was one of the places I used to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books in. Somehow or other, especially in Malaysia, we used, to, more than any other place, we used to get feedback from people that, why does your guru always call people rascals? Why all these rascals, nonsense, animals, fool number one? They couldn't, they couldn't understand it. So Srila Prabhupada is very aggressive, but he, and it might have appeared to the, what we might call the victims of his aggression, that he was nasty. But, but that aggression, you couldn't really say that anyone was the victim, or they were rather the uh, fortunate recipient, even though they couldn't understand it. I mean, look at this. Sewage water clean enough to drink. With a photo of the student smelling the urinal to find out what it smells like. <laughs> and this is, the, this is news. This is supposed to be taken as the, uh, as a good news for the advancement of civilization. Mr. the Prabhupada, he point out this is, this is madness. First of all, it's madness when, what do you want to drink? Sewage water. And then it's double madness that people take it seriously. The same kind of thing was going on when Srila Prabhupada was present. It always brought to Srila Prabhupada's attention that they, the, uh, the scientists, they want to make butter out of human stew. <laughs> and... But well, Prabhupada would point out that, you know, what's the, what's the point? <laughs> you don't need to make it out of human soul. By God's grace, there are cows and there is milk, but it, you can make butter out of milk, but they have all these wonderful plans, trying to do better than nature. So, Srila Prabhupada told the devotees, especially those with scientific qualifications, that it's not... He said, worshipping Krishna is our internal affair. But our 
external affair is preaching in society and pointing out the rascal, the, the nonsense. The whole of modern society is based on Darwinism and Freudism and various other shades of rascalism that have developed on these two pillars of nonsense and atheism and demonism. So Srila Prabhupada wanted to expose that this Darwinism, it's this idea that Asatya, basically what is Darwinism? Asatya Mapratishtamte Jagadahura Nishvaram. There's no God, there's no basis. Everything is just going on without any cause. And the whole of modern society is based on And Freud, this, uh, everything is, all the problems in human society are caused because we're not, we have taboos against sex. We should just engage in sex as much as possible. They believe it. And then uh, Darwin, Freud and Marx, Srila Prabhupada said, these are the three most prominent demons of the 20th century. Of course they didn't all live in the 20th century, but uh, their, their influence shaped the 20th century. So Srila Prabhupada wanted to ex expose this. He was very serious about it. I mean, often nowadays when we say about this, the devotees just start laughing. They think it's a joke. But Srila Prabhupada wasn't joking. He wanted his disciples to go out in the world and make propaganda against this nonsense. He told his scientist disciples, you should go and hold big conferences all over the world to prove the scientists are too on, wrong on two points. One thing is that they never went to the moon. And another one is that the chicken is a better scientist than you. Because you say that you will produce life in future, but the chicken is laying an egg and producing life every day. The chicken is a science, better scientist than you. The proverb is very serious. You read that Life Comes From Life book, when Hans Aduda exposed this atheist, Dr. Kavok, Prabhupada was very pleased with it. He wasn't very pleased when he heard that one devotee, who didn't actually take initiation with Prabhupada, but there was one, he was living at Radha Kun. Prabhupada didn't say, oh, that's very good. But he said, very good, when Hans Aduda defeated publicly this Dr. Kavok. So, like I was saying, you should, as you, as brahmacharis, you want to dedicate yourselves in the service of Srila Prabhupada's mission. It's a heavy mission, and the, the heaviness is not so much the, the sleeping on the floor and the discipline and getting up in the morning and, all right, that's brahmachari life, but the real test is to stand opposed to all the nonsense of human society, the bodily concept of life, in which people are thinking, I am this body and everything in relation to this body is me. King Puna Agamano Bhavit, he won't come back again. So this should be attacked. When I was saying Prabhupada is aggressive, it wasn't the uh, Ag aggressiveness of a gunda, just but it was very uh, sophisticated, you could say. It doesn't mean that unintelligent, a very intelligent aggressiveness. Srila Prabhupada himself gave the example of uh, one who knows the science, they can press on the weak point in the body and kill someone. If you know, there's Kung Fu or something like that, there's some point. If you press on it, you'll kill the person. So Prabhupada said, I find the weak point in their philosophy and I keep on pushing on that until it collapses. So Srila Prabhupada like this, he was a, a very philosophical, he was always talking philosophy, not in this uh, up in the air, pie in the sky, theoretical kind of manner, but very practical. Just like when Srila Prabhupada 
arrived at Hyderabad once. There had been a long drought. And uh, the newspaper reporters asked him, Are you a Dvaita Vadi or an Advaita Vadi? And Prabhupada said, That's not a very it's not a good question. He said, There's no water here. Why don't you be practical? Anad Bhavanti Bhutani Parjanyadana Samna. What's the next line? Yagya Bhavati Parjanyo. So we have to, there's no food because there's no rain, there's no rain because there's no yagya. So we're going to perform Sankhita and Yagya. This is practical. And within two days of Prabhupada's Harinam Sankhita and Yagya in Hyderabad, rain fell profusely after many months. So Srila Prabhupada is very practical. You see this question. They need, are you a Dvaita Vadi or an Advaita Vadi? It seems like a very important question, doesn't it? But Prabhupada said, what does it matter if you don't have water, you don't have rain, you don't have food? Let's be practical. So, uh, yeah, the, the real austerity of being a Brahmachari preacher, which is not really austerity, for those who are actually brahmacharis, there's no austerity, it's all bliss. You see? If you're thinking it's austerity, then if we think it's difficult and I don't like it, then we're not properly situated anyway. But the real austerity is not lying on the floor and uh, having a disciplined life, having to get up early in the morning and all this. Of course, you don't have the austerity of freezing coal in Bombay, there's no such thing. So it's quite a good climate. But uh, the real austerity is that of standing against all the nonsense of human society, day in, day out, year after year. And we've seen that many devotees, they don't want to do that. Devotees who were formerly enthusiastic to preach against all this mumbo-jumbo in the name of science. And many of them, they just withdrew at some point. It's much easier to be nice to people than to be aggressive. Actually, being aggressive is being nice. So-called being nice and letting people remain in maya, that is the niceness of materialists, which is actually an expression of their envy. When people say to you, are you how are you? Very well, thank you. They're simply expressing their mutual envy by uh, pretending to each other that everything is very nice when it's not. By pretending that anything can be nice without Krishna. So they're just, in the name of being nice, they're just envying each other and envying Krishna. So, to be aggressive, you don't get the same kind of reaction. If we tell people, if someone, for instance, says to you, oh, it's my birthday, and you say to them, well, what the hell, what does it matter? You're just dead, it means you're just dead another day more than yesterday. <laughs> and well, people think, well, that's not very nice. It's not very nice, from the materialistic perspective, but that's just an example. But uh, it is nice because it's in relation to the truth, to the reality. We say, oh, very good, very nice, birthday. Yeah, what do you mean, birthday? Yeah, how many births have you had? When are you going to stop having birthdays? <laughs> <laughs> stop getting born. Birthday is all nonsense. Real birthday, just like every Janmashtami, I tell devotees that today is my birthday. I say, oh, no, I didn't know you were born on Janmashtami. I was initiated on that day. That's my birthday. So, uh, what's nice? To help people be in Maya or to help them to come out of Maya? So, like I say, it's easier just to be nice. And you say, yeah, well, they'll gradually introduce Krishna gradually, 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 gradually. Yeah, you can do it. At least I saw Srila Prabhupada, he was for shock treatment. <laughs> Just tell him, this is, this is the fact. Itaj Gyan, Iti this is reality. And this, smelling the urinal, 
This is the news. This is this is what they say, advancement of science. The young girl who, according to Vedic understanding, should be married anyway, instead of going to college and having three or four boyfriends, she's smelling the urinal. Just like Prabhupada said, that you should tell the judge in the court in America, they're ch charging, they're charging the Hare Krishna devotees of being brainwashing. Prabhupada said, you should tell them that your society is the society of licking the dripping vagina. That is what you're interested in. He said, just like the dogs, they go and smell each other's genitals. So that your whole society is simply based on on sex. He said, tell them in the court. They didn't tell them. They were afraid to. <laughs> That's what Prabhupada said to them. It's heavy, isn't it? But it's a fact, isn't it? The whole of modern society is just like when two dogs get together, they smell each other's genitals and lick it. And then the whole modern society, that's all it's doing. Sim everything is geared up to enjoying the genitals. That's all. And here you are. Front page. Student is smelling the urinal. Pratyaksha. And telling you sewage water is clean enough to drink. He's solving the problems. There's not enough drinking water in Mumbai? No problem. You can drink the sewage water. And it says, you see, Praman, the Mumbai mirror says, it's safe enough to drink. So there you go, rascals. All right, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. I have to go. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Mumbai Mirror Keep. The class from the Mumbai Mirror, right? So, no, no giants for this. Okay, who did I take this from? You want to take it back? Today's message from my Hare Krishna. Yep, let's turn it on. Okay, you have to go, right? Well, I guess I could take one or two questions. So I have a little time. All right. I'll take one or two questions. One or two. All right, your name. What's your name, Prabhu? Very good, so My All name right. is uh, Wilfred. Wilfred. Okay. Hare Krishna. Uh, you were talking earlier about Brahmacharya like, being blissful. Yeah. If you find it difficult, then you're probably not properly situated. Yeah, well, I mean, definitely there's difficulties, but if you're finding it more difficult than not difficult, day after day, then what are you doing in the Brahmacharya Ashram? You're not in the right place. If you find everything difficult, then you should go to the ashram of difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> and it's difficult. <laughs> and then when you go to that ashram, you'll realize how nice the Brahmacharya ashram is. But then it's too late by the time you get there. So one who cannot understand by Hearing and internalizing higher knowledge, he has to learn by the school of hard knocks. Very hard. Very tough. Even you'll see so many nice Grihastha couples, but my God, they have to work down hard to maintain that Griha. So... It's not so nice. Yeah, what's your question? Um, I was wondering, you're saying that... Yeah, okay, let the mic come. You're saying that Srila Prabhupada used to deal with people with shock treatment. Yeah, not all the time, but quite often. And I was wondering, they said, 
shouldn't disturb the minds of of others. Yeah, and then in the purple, Prabhupada says, well, actually, you should. <laughs> in the purport, he writes that the devotees of the Lord are more merciful than the Lord. <laughs> and therefore, they do. There are many cases. There was Mahabuddhi and came to Proverbs and His first time Prabhupada, his first time he'd ever come to a temple or anything, and Prabhupada was just very heavy with him. He wasn't a disciple or even planning to be a disciple or anything like that. Prabhupada was just very, very heavy with him. And then he was driving back, and he was thinking, I'll never go there again. And he was driving on, he was thinking that actually everything he said was true, I'm just a puffed up rascal. And he came back the next day with a check for a thousand dollars, which in those days, a thousand dollars is worth a lot more. No one gave donations that big in those days. And uh, in a short time, he just surrendered his life. Because he was just used to people. He was materially successful. He was used to people flattering him, and Prabhupada didn't flatter him. He just cut him down like anything. It's a risk. You might turn. Uh, that professor I was telling, uh, the one who, about uh, you're a cheater because you say you're che teaching Hinduism, and uh, he was upset for years. He was actually from uh, Dalab Sampradaya backgrounds, Gujarati, he was teaching in America, but he is a kind, he lapsed away from Vaishnavism and become more or less uh, a Mayavadi. But there came a time, some years later, when Prabhupada's kind aggression registered and he realized actually he was right. And he went back to his Valab Sampradaya roots. So there's no harm in speaking the truth. It's always good to speak the truth. Although we should know what the truth is. And we should uh, speak it in a manner of serving the truth, not of serving our own egoism. And personally, I have a lot of experience of people getting upset with me because I say things to them which they don't like. And uh, but it's often very effective also. In London once, I was taken to a place where I was told that, well, it, it's a Sai Baba temple, so, you know, we don't have any other place to hold our program, so, you know, please, <laughs> don't say anything about it. So I didn't, all the way through the lecture, I didn't say anything about Sai Baba. Yet at the end, someone gave some stupid question. It wasn't about Sai Baba, but I said, I told him, that's a stupid question. You see, you're so damn stupid, you're worshipping this Sai Baba. And that was, he had to be the owner of the temple, I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, that was the last time they ever used that place. And the devotee was upset, who had organized the program. And I said, well, what do you want to do a thing? What do you want to do a program in the Sai Baba temple for anyway? You know, and you can't speak the truth. You can, you're always constrained. But he was upset with me. But then after a short time they found a much better place and then he was happy with me. He said, oh actually, you know, it's good that we got thrown over there because we got a much better place, a much bigger place. So that's just one example. Once in, uh, someone came up to me and said, you see, for the last 12 years I've been chanting 16 rounds, but I just can't give up onions and garlic. And I've asked so many people, and, uh, you know, I asked so many sannyasis, and they never, they never said anything you can make. Could you say something there? I said, 12 years? I'm not going to waste my time talking to you. 12 years and you couldn't give up onions and garlic and just walked away. And that did it for him. He <laughs> thought, so, oh, well. 
I just said, I just think that it's, 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 it's useless, you know, 12 years and you couldn't even go with onions and garlic. And that made the difference. So, you know, it can work. It's like I said, it's, it's always good to speak the truth, even if pe mostly people are not ready to hear it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll never when will they ever be ready to hear it just like people say about worshipping demigod you see we've been worshipping this demigod in our family for the last 46 generations and you know, how can we stop now and they say well we have to stop sometime because as long as you're worshipping demigods you're going to have to take birth again so you're going to get up in this life or after 46 generations more or when are you going to stop? Where do you stop now? Otherwise, what are you doing? You're never going to get the fruit of chanting Hare Krishna as long as you're attached to mundane dharma. So, taking to Krishna consciousness means having a completely different outlook on life. It doesn't mean that you become, you know, like uh, Mother Teresa or something like that. You know, some, you become nice in the mundane sense. But you become practically an enemy to everyone in the world. Because, at least from their perspective, you're not actually their enemy, but from their perspective, you are a threat to everything they believe in. You are proving that it is not only possible, but uh, highly possible to be fully satisfied without sense gratification. That's a terrible threat. You are a living threat to their everything that the whole of modern civilization stands for. So let people know. Why pretend that we have anything to do with it? Nonsense. Urinal smelling civilization. <laughs> everything Prabhupada said practically went against everything that materialists believe in. Girls shouldn't have education. They should just stay at home and learn to cook and learn to be faithful, get married, young, have children as soon as they're able. These are all things that Prabhupada said. No academic education. It's all demonism. Our children, we should teach them Reading and writing, so they can read my books, Srila Prabhupada. That is their education. They don't need all this demoniac education, government syllabus. If we say that, people won't like it. But if they follow that, if they follow the government syllabus, then they won't become Krishna conscious. They'll they might chant Hare Krishna, but they'll still believe in Dharma. Unless you have a systematic education in why Darwinism is wrong, you're definitely going to believe it's right, because that's what everyone else says and thinks, and lives their life according to. Unless we're systematically, daily, instructed in the uselessness of material life and material sense enjoyment and material position, and name, fame, glory, MSc, PhD, and all these other varieties of nonsense, we're going to think it's very good, because everyone else thinks it's very good. It seems that it's very good. So unless we're instructed in why it's not very good, it's just an obstacle to bhakti. Joro vidya, jato mayar bhaiva, tomar bhajane bhagra. Then we're going to think it's very good. And we won't be in line with Krishna. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go. Yeah. All right. Please excuse me, but I have a, a train to catch, as they say, as the idiom goes. Don't actually catch a train. But <laughs> it's idiomatic usage. Thank you, Maharaj, for giving us your valuable time.
So let us express our gratitude to His Holiness Bhakti Vikas Maharaj by loudly chanting. So as you three times told me to chant Hari, 